All right, welcome in everybody to Science and Kirk Turp Talk here on 1300 AM, The Bet, and myself and Wayne Viner are deep inside uh, the lower area of the uh, Xfinity Center. We just had media day. And why don't we do football first, then we'll talk some hoops. Sure. Because football is happening right now, big time. And Wayne, how much of a big loss was this to Illinois last week? Uh, To me, it took you out of the realm of being able to actually have a great season. You're going to have to do a lot now to get back in that. It's a game that you should have won, in my opinion. These are just opinions, but having watched it like you have for 40-plus years, you have a team that's... 50. For you for 50. (laughs) This is my 40th anniversary season uh, of being here. Uh, Illinois was not on the best trajectory. Maryland came off a pretty good showing at Ohio State, and you expect them to come out and take care of business. And you can go through this game, statistically it wasn't that bad, but in key moments, Maryland just didn't stand up, and it cost them in the end. So we know the uh, two corners were out, and it proved to be the fatal blow, all right, really. But also, the offense, I don't know what was the word for it. This was a team that everybody scores points against. All right? I mean, Purdue put up 44 against them. And yet, Maryland with Talia and all the, you know, was it the loss of Corey Dyches, or what was it offensively that wasn't working in your eyes? Well, we were down two offensive linemen, and that changed the run game. And I asked Roman Hemby about it, and he said, you know, there's still the same running plays, but it changed the run game, in my opinion. It changed the pass blocking, wasn't as good. And then you had, as you said, Corey Dyches, who's a big outlet for Leah wasn't there. The other guy that sort of disappeared was Ty Felton, who a couple weeks ago scores three touchdowns in the first half, doesn't do much. It looked to me like Leah latched on to Caden Prather, and if that wasn't there, there wasn't that much of a play. Something you didn't bring up is the play calling. That was next, but go ahead. Well, you can take this one. Well, I was shocked. Third and five with the game on the line. Yeah, they had a chance to tie. It was a little problematic because the kicker, uh, Howes, has not really been great from long range. So, you know, to to run the ball, to me, you, you don't want to be in the position of having to kick a 48-yard field goal for a guy who hasn't been successful there. But to his credit, he came through. But, wow, don't you throw the ball with a chance to win the game right there. That's what I didn't understand. I mean, he had, co- coach has all the confidence in the world in Loxley, and so does Josh Gaddis. In, in I, Leah? Well, in Leah, rather. Well, that, that, if you have all the confidence in the world in that guy, you probably throw the ball there. Yeah, but he said, you tell him what Loxley said when you asked him that question. Well, they had a run and a pass called, right? and they went with the run, and if you execute the run, the play works. And they, the problem is the execution. Um, you can take it for what it's worth. Last week at Ohio State, they had a third and a fourth down. When you knew they were going for it, they run the ball. Saturday night, you know they have to score. They run the ball. Something's not right here. I don't know what it is, but it does seem a bit off to me. Well, it was a tough loss. And they had taken care of business so far this year. Oh, hold on. But before we go to the tough yeah. loss, you do, even though I was upset, and I'm still upset, you have to give some credit. They got down by 10, and in the fourth quarter, when you needed to do it, the defense shuts down Indiana, uh, Illinois three times in a row. Maryland scores 10 points in the last 10 minutes, and it took a defensive breakdown at the end to give up that field goal. So had Maryland found a way to get to overtime or pulled that out, you go, look, they came back. you got to give them some credit for coming back. They shouldn't have been in a position that you had to do that. They do it, and the defense lets them down. And look, credit to Illinois. If you had told me they were going to come here, messy weather, Maryland looks pretty good. They don't. I mean, Illinois had to put forth a really good. You have effort. to give it credit to. You have to give credit to Illinois. Uh, but th- then we can talk special teams. Let me finish. Mm-hmm. When we went into the season, you and myself and Mason looked at the schedule and said, "You know, you said we're going to be five and zero." You said it to me. You were pretty confident. Yep. And what were we? 5-0. And, and I also said we were going to lose to Ohio State and Illinois. 
Well, and, and I don't remember you saying anything yeah. about Illinois, but yeah. I'll take you at your word. Yeah. But you look at the schedule and you say, well, what is our path to nine wins? Because that would have been a great season, right or wrong. Right. And it's still out there. It it's is. still possible if you throw in a bowl game that you might be able to win. I wasn't counting the bowl game. All right, but here's my point. You got two games, you got two losses, you got two games with Michigan and uh, Penn State where you're going to be 20-point underdogs or thereabouts. They're going to be very tough to win. It's just a fact. But the other three games are winnable. All right, there's no question. Two of them are on the road, and that's going to be tough. All three of them are on the road, and it's going to be tough to run that table. Which, you know, and if they can win... If they can win all three and they lose the two at home, which sounds backwards, yeah. you're eight and four. And, and nobody's fine. gonna be upset. That's fine. And those road games are Northwestern, they're at Nebraska, and they're at Rutgers on Thanksgiving weekend. The two home games are Penn State and Michigan. Right. Now the three road games, Maryland's favorite over Northwestern. They'll be favored over uh, Nebraska. We'll see. They will be, unless they lose to Northwestern. And they won't be favored against Rutgers, but it'll be pick them or plus or minus one or two. And that game can go either way. All the games really can. But uh, it's just very disappointing because this is a game that's at home. And a game at home, you should beat a team that you're 14-point favorites over. You should, but it also echoes back to other times that this happened. The Purdue. Purdue. Yeah, and people pick on that Temple game a few years ago when Maryland goes to Temple and should win the game, and there's a very pro-Maryland crowd up in Philly. They lose the game. There's been too many games that pop out, and it's the difference between the sixth win, the seventh win, the eighth win. Maryland needs help because there's three games generally every season that you're not going to win for the most part. Which ends next year. Look, when you okay. had Oregon or Washington in this or USC. mix, or USC <laughs> in this mix, you have the same problem. Right. So next year, Maryland gets to go to Oregon, and USC comes here. I don't know if that's harder or not as hard as Penn State. Well, I Michigan, think, I think, I think, just, mm-hmm. I do believe that USC is not in the caliber of those three teams that I mentioned. You know, you're talking about two, three, and seven, all right? And that's, that's a big task to beat one of those teams. Right. So but until they do, Wayne... Until they do, yeah. where will we be? We'll be locked in that eight and four, seven, five thing. And, and eight and four. And nobody's upset about that. Look, you would have been a lot happier had you beaten Illinois at home for homecoming right. and go to Nebraska and lose. Correct. Oh, it's Nebraska. They, they still have 80,000 people, and they still do. And it's the biggest thing going on in Nebraska. I can understand you lose that game. It's losing the games that make no sense. So you said before. To make this work, you're probably going to lose a game you should have won, and now you have to win a game you're supposed to lose. The problem is Correct. there's two games that are almost impossible. I mean, they really are a challenge. Penn, Mason says to me, Penn State, in his eyes, is the best team in the country. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people think Michigan already is the best team in the country. So we're playing two teams that are going to be in the final eight, right or wrong, in the, yeah. in the tournament, and uh, to pull that upset is going to be very tough. Uh so, moving along here, the three road games is going to be tough. Uh, tell me, give me an update on injuries. We didn't have any media day today because there's no game this week. Mm-hmm. And looking ahead, we'll deal, we'll deal with uh, Northwestern next week. Okay. All right, it's no so big deal. your injury updates. Uh, Dante Trader was out. They expect him back. Uh, and he, you did hear the rumor about Dante Trader. Well, I'll leave that to you. Okay, he might be playing lacrosse this year. That would Every be time me and you talk to him, and we know him pretty well, the kid loves lacrosse. He does. Uh, Tarheep Still should be back. On the offensive line, Corey Bullock, who plays guard, probably not going to come back. And we have to worry about who's actually going to play right tackle or left tackle. They've been moving guys in and out, and they just have to figure out who's going to play. So that revolving door. Corey Deitch's lower leg injury should be back for, Northwest, uh, for Northwestern, and that should that would be that would be good. All right, we're here at Media Day. My first impressions are the confidence that Willard has in his new guys. I asked him a question about that. You asked him a question about the confidence he has in the building, and you could see he's overflowing with it. But I was impressed when he said the three new guys: Jonathan Lamoth, Deshaun Howard Smith, and Jamie Kaiser Jr. 
who are all impressive physically looking guys here every morning at 7 a.m. since they got on campus. I mean, that's what you want. He's talking about guys, and he mentioned these as the best freshmen he's ever had because of their competitive, they just aren't gonna lose. And when you talk about great athletes, and I don't mean necessarily compare anybody with a Michael Jordan or a Jerry Rice or somebody, or a Ray Lewis, these guys just, the whole point is they're not gonna lose. Yeah, uh, that's their attitude, but when you hear kids are here seven in the morning where they don't have to be, you're impressed. So then they bring up, uh, his last name, it's Jordan Geronimo, right? Right. And that his ability to play five spots defensively actually played him at center a little bit. This is a guy that transferred from Indiana. What was your take on that? Yeah, I was, you know, the great things I've heard about them make me, like, wonder why is Indiana let him go? You know, I don't, he didn't get a lot of playing time there, though. No. But I don't know, but well, he's I know position. Coach Willer is excited about him. You start to talk about positionless basketball. When Jamie Kaiser got up, or maybe it was DHS who got up and walked by us, he said, look at the size of that guy. He's 19 years old. Look at the... And then you realize, you said, he can actually play any position he wants. Right. And that's the key. They're going to have a point guard with Jameer. they got a center with Juju. And then they're going to have guys who just can play basketball. Right. And listen, he said that uh, Deshaun Harris-Smith is the best competitor he's ever run across. Now, that's, that's a big statement coming from a guy who had so much success at Seton Hall and uh, the best ever. And then I got to talk to him for a few minutes, and we're going to put some uh, sound together for Saturday, the Sports Maven. But when I got to talk to him, he projects that. There's an air of confidence about him that you love. All right? We didn't get to talk to to Jameer or Dante, but we know where they're at. Right. And and looks, Dante yeah. looked a, a lot more physical, am I right or wrong? Every year he's looking more physical. I right. was going to ask Kevin, I didn't get a chance to ask the coach, what's it like having guys in this COVID era that are 23, 24-ish years old as opposed to 19, 18? And I'm sure that's different. These are men. They're not particularly the college kids you might remember from years back. I also got to talk to Jamie Kaiser about being a quarterback and what the difference is for somebody who likes to play football. And it, it's it just, there's a toughness factor with these kids coming in that I think is going to play really well for this conference. They look like Big Ten sized athletes. And that, that's a change. We it, had our trouble on the road last year. And being on the road, you really need that competitive edge. Not that we didn't have it, but I think Deshaun, Deshaun Howard Smith really brings that. And I think he'll bring it to the whole team. I think it's funny and refreshing that we have two Big Ten, all Big Ten players, with national problems in Juju and Jameer. Right. And we're talking about guys that we've never really met before, and that's what's popping to us is look at these freshmen. Yeah, yeah we have all Big Ten players almost as a – we'll talk about them later. Look at these freshmen. That's an amazing spot to be in. And yet, Wayne, no votes in the top 25. Both guys – None. I'm telling you, none. I, I studied it last night. But 29th, so there you go. But, but they, they are projected in the pre two season to call bracketology for being like a six or seven seed. I think that just being here and seeing what's going on, you know, this is a team that will do better than last year, in my opinion. You know, that home schedule last year, except for that UCLA game was as exciting a home schedule as we've had in 15 years. Uh, Correct. Since Gravis was here. So Maryland goes on the road early with Villanova. They go in January to UCLA. In between there, there's two Big Ten games. What do you make of the schedule for this year, and, and when do you think you're going to see Georgetown, Maryland get it on? Well, you, you, you gave me a softball there yeah, yeah. because Coach Willard said it's just about written up that him and uh, – the coach from Georgetown have gotten together mm -hmm. and they're ready to announce a, a, a deal for games. And it sounds to me like it's more than two years. It could be like a four-year deal, home and home, or maybe all neutral. I don't know. But, you know, I don't consider the Verizon Center neutral, no. you know. Well, that's Georgetown's problem with this is they don't get a home game out of it. Right. But they'll get a dominance of tickets for Verizon Center. 
All right, but uh, that place is so big. We went there the last time. They're they not. Played. They weren't sold out. They weren't sold out. Most of the fans were Maryland fans. Well, I can't answer what they're going to do. They could take us in their gym. You know what I mean? Can but can you imagine Maryland Georgetown playing in a twenty five hundred seat <laughs> gym on campus at Georgetown? That would be. That would be great. That'd be an, an uh, instant classic just because of the venue. Well, that's what might uh, wind up happening. And he also, he said that next, you know, he talked about last year's uh, gamut where we had five games in like 11 days that culminated in us getting destroyed by UCLA. Mm -hmm. He's not doing that again this year. He's a little bit smarter with it. He learned last year. But he did talk about next year. He, he said the Asheville tournament was written into the schedule. He had no choice. But he joined the Empire Classic, which is always four really good teams. And, uh, you know, like, like our good friend John Tillman, he spends a lot of time on the schedule. All right, there's no doubt about it. And uh, Well, we have to close with that. Right. So well, with, with the, what would you hear about the fall ball lacrosse? I've uh, got to get that in here. All right. Maryland looked great, and the guy who really stood out, I'm going to talk this a little bit later in segment three, was Eric Maliver. Eric Maliver is back. He's fast. He's uh, faster. He's stronger. Everything about him, and he dominated the game. And get go to InsideLacrosse.com. There's an article about how well Eric played, and the nine, the nine or ten, the nine or ten guys who comprom who complete that offense. Wayne, it's going to be a great year. It's it, early. It is, but you got to get uh, get your local knee surgeon involved. He's going to be rooting for Eric Molliver coming off an ACL and Logan McDaniel, who didn't play, who's coming off an ACL. So as long look, as look, ACLs could be more than a year. He might barely make it back for the beginning of this season, or could he redshirt again? You know, no, I think he's. You're talking about Logan. Yeah, McDaniel's. I think he's going to play. I do too, but you never know. He's not ready. He can't. Well, they. they Okay. Well, you know what? We can pick that up in a week or two. Maybe we can find John. But you know what's amazing? What? When you remember how he got hurt. It was so ridiculous. At we were went, losing by five goals with two minutes left. Yeah. You know, I'll never understand that. But that's it. We are out of time. Wayne, thanks for coming on as always. And, uh, you know, Northwestern's coming up. It's got to happen. And, right? and we, the airline reservations are made, so you will have Turp Talk post game live from Evanston. Which we love.